Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you, David and Carolyn, for inviting me back on this network that I love and admire so much. And thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for turning up tonight to listen to whatever I can say that could help you get in direct connection with the mother of the universe, Mary. I'm not going to speak as a scholar and I'm not going to speak even as a teacher. I'm going to speak to you from the depths of my heart as a child of Mary that I have come to know through her grace as not only the mother of Christian mysticism, but as the universal mother who is turning the face of Mary towards humanity at this moment when we are in our deepest need of being encouraged and sustained and given hope and strength and stamina and peace and passion. What is the mother? I could give you a lot of fancy concepts and quotations, but I'm not going to give those tonight. Because for me, Mary is the simplest of all realities. And the deepest definition of what the mother is, is also the simplest. And it goes like this. The mother is pure, naked, visceral, embodied, peaceful and passionate love. The mother is pure, naked, visceral, embodied, peaceful and passionate love. And when you hear that, many of you might be saying to yourself, I don't really know what you're talking about. I don't know that love that you're speaking of. I'm here to tell you tenderly, but strongly that you do. You do know that love. You know that love when you look out of a car in Utah at a blazing mountain and your whole being is suddenly inflamed with an awe you've never experienced before. You know that love when you're listening to Tina Turner or Beethoven and suddenly you feel yourself possessed by a joy that makes you want to dance even if you, like me, have got sciatica. You know that love when you're sitting with a great friend and suddenly a warmth spreads through your mind and heart and soul and body and it takes all your strength not to go over to where your friend is sitting and just give him or her a massive and prolonged hug because you're so grateful that you have a friend like that. You know that love, whatever sexuality you are, when you make love, with someone who loves you with their whole being as you love them with your whole being. And the ecstasy you experience washes you away and makes you infinitely grateful to be alive. You know that love when you've done something excruciatingly stupid to someone you love very deeply. And instead of damning you or demonizing you or making you feel small, they say to you, you hurt me, but I'm much more concerned about your pain than I am about mine. And I forgive you because I love you. And the feeling that floods you at that moment the feeling of being seen in all your misery and squalor and stupidity and yet loved and yet forgiven is 
an overwhelming initiation into the secret powers that govern our lives. All of this, I know you know. I know you know because you're a human being. And I know you know it because everyone I have ever known, whether they believe in God or the mother or not, whatever they believe, have had these moments in life when life suddenly burns away a kind of veil that you'd never believed existed and shows you something that stuns you beyond reason by its beauty and makes a part of you want to fall on your knees and just say thank you whoever whatever you are thank you thank you for having made me a human being capable of feeling this the only thing we need to do next and I'm inviting you to do this, is to recognize what all the great mystic lovers of the mother of all of the traditions know, because they've been initiated by grace, by her grace into it, to recognize that all these loves that I've described, which I know you all know, <laughs> are actually rays from a secret sun, S-U-N, of love that is a divine gift installed forever in every single human heart. Whatever your religion or sexuality or tribe or nation. And the only thing that's required of you is to recognize what all of these great mystics are trying to convey to us, to recognize that the real holy forces that govern and create the universe and are trying so deeply to help and awaken us are very subtle. They're invisible and very subtle. But because they're invisible and very subtle, it is hard for those of us trained in the hard logic of the Western world and in the fundamentalism of worshiping science to begin to begin to know the unity of them all in the vast, all-embracing, all-inclusive love of the mother, the pure, naked, visceral love of the mother. But if you just take one step, she will help you. And the step that we're invited to take can be put very simply, follow the wonder, follow the wonder. And just ask yourself when you see that mountain out of the car window, how could such beauty exist? What is its source? What is its meaning? And ask yourself when you feel that love for your friend or your lover or your cat, as I feel it for my cat, where does this love come from? Why have I been made in such a way that I can experience such an amazing love in such a way that I have never experienced it before and never even knew it existed? I've experienced in my life many forms of love, but it's only in my 60s with my cat that while holding her and stroking her and feeling her infinite love for me that I've asked myself how can such tenderness such beauty such sweetness exist how can it be that there can be such a love as the one that I know with her through grace 
And when you follow the wonder and follow that question and just turn to a mystery beyond reason, the mystery of the presence of this love in your consciousness, something amazing will over time be revealed to you. And that is that this love lives in you as a secret sun, a unified, burning, peaceful, passionate, secret sun that mirrors the great, glowing, gorgeous, cosmic sun of the mother's all creative, all transforming love that wears the face of Mary, the human and divine Mary, and that is turned now towards all of us, whatever religion we belong to, whatever tribe we belong to, whatever nation we belong to. I don't have to sell Mary to you because Mary is the singly most loved, most revered spiritual figure in the whole of human history. This isn't an exaggeration. She's not only adored by Christians, she's not only adored by Christian mystics, she's adored in Islam as the holiest of women who ever walked the earth, and she's adored by all Sufi mystics. She's adored by Hindu mystics like Ramakrishna, and I've seen representations of her in little huts of naked mystics by the side of the river in Nepal. Agoris who are sitting on the skulls of their father. And I've talked about her with the Dalai Lama who reveres her as a manifestation of the force of compassion. So Mary is everywhere. And Mary is recognized as this force of love that I'm describing by billions of ordinary, extraordinary people like you and I. And when through grace and through following that question and following the wonder, you discover the discovery that changes everything in the human life that the loves you are experiencing all come as rays from a secret sun that is in your heart. When you discover that, and when you begin in very flawed and very tentative ways at the beginning, to start acting from the power and the force and the beauty and the passion and the peace and the strength of that love that you now know is your essential nature, when you start acting from that embodied, visceral, pure, naked love force that is her in you, you make the other discovery that rocks your world and changes your life and transforms paralysis and despair and cynicism into a grounded, patient, radical hope. You discover that when you act from the love force of her, subtly amazing things start to happen. Because actions that are born from that force are absolutely blessed and empowered by the secret son of the mother's infinite unconditional love. And actions born from that force can find solutions in impossible seeming situations, breed 
extraordinary new possibilities out of what seems like terminal despair and give you courage to keep acting, keep giving, keep putting love into ordinary and extraordinary action in ways that over time will reveal to you that when you are an instrument of that love force, you become someone who is collaborating with the great mystery of our time, which is nothing less than the birth through this love force of the universal mother, whose name for me is Mary. The birth through the universal love force of this mother out of the chaos and darkness and madness and despair of a willed destruction of all the structures, the patriarchal structures that separate us from this love, which we are living through now. The birth in and through and beyond this destruction of a new embodied, love empowered, love transformed humanity capable through grace of working directly with her to create unbelievable amazing new possibilities that we can barely imagine now but which are already appearing on the earth in the amazing resistance of the Iranian women, in the new discoveries of quantum science, in the extraordinary ordinary heroism of millions of people all over the world, which are not just saying no to the old structures, but saying a huge yes to protecting animals, feeding the poor, giving away money to create marvelous educational opportunities for people who have no education, and a host of other things. This invisible, secret, nonviolent army of the mother that is everywhere when you open your eyes and see the birth is happening now. And our task, it really is becoming more and more clear to me, is to just accept that we have in the mother, our mother, your mother, my mother, someone who far beyond any reason loves us crazily, profoundly, practically, unconditionally, and will do absolutely any to help us grow into our true magnificence, our true humble dedication and power and commitment to building and radiating the beauty and truth and justice of a holy new world. So let's just turn and look at the life of this amazing woman who became one with the motherhood of God and is now the face that through the apparitions and through appearing to all kinds of people all over the world, and I've met many of them. I'll tell you one story, which is very funny. I, when I published one of my first books on the mother, I had a call from a woman who was very angry and she happened to be a Jewish woman. And she said, look, it's very inconvenient what's going on. And I want you to help me get rid of this woman, Mary, who's appearing in my garden, because I am not a Christian and the Christians have been guilty of anti-Semitism, racism and everything. And I have nothing whatever to do with the Christian revelation. And she was really angry and I said, look, I completely understand why you would find the boys club Christianity absolutely disgusting. And I understand what they've done and I'm with you and I understand why you're angry, but why don't you just talk to her as one Jewish woman to another? And at that moment, she just roared with 
laughter and said, well, I never thought of that. And she did, and amazing things happened in her life. And there's another story that I can't help telling you about a Buddhist monk whom I know, not Clark Strand, who also tells a story like this, but another who was very, very Buddhist and very austere and ascetic, so a Hinayana Buddhist. And again, he wrote to me and he said, look, it's incredibly embarrassing what's going on. Mary is appearing to me in my cell. And she's saying, look, I'm your mother and I'm here and I'll help you in your whatever path you take. Don't worry about it. He said, this is really annoying because I don't believe in any figures or mothers and all of this stuff. I, what am I to do? <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, well, I understand, you know, the Hinayana path is very, very austere and all that. And I respect it incredibly, but why don't you try just having a real conversation with her and asking her for advice? She'll give it to you. So he said, well, I'd never thought of that. And he tried it. And his practice and his understanding of the spiritual path expanded infinitely because over time he realized what all of us who love her realize, which is that she's everybody's mother and she's here to help everyone. And it doesn't matter whether you're drunk or sober, whether you're a serial killer or a saint, whether you're Democrat or Republican, or whether you're a we or a they or a gay or a anything. She is your mother and she loves you crazily and deeply and practically and wisely. And own, if you just turn to her, she will flood you with grace because she knows where we are. She knows we are in the most dangerous moment of our evolutionary history. She knows we are threatened by despair, denial, stupidity, acting out, craziness of every kind. She knows that. And she is in her deepest heart, loving us more because we're so lost and willing to go to the most extraordinary lengths. And I know this from my own inmost experience, willing to go to the most extraordinary lengths to say to us and prove to us and show us, I'm here, I'll help you. Don't worry rest in my arms, rely on me, let me guide you tenderly and wisely. Those aren't words, those are the experiences of all those who just follow the wonder, find the secret sun, start experiencing the ways in which even the most ordinary actions born from love can transform and turn to the possibility, the amazing possibility, that in Mary, you, whoever you may be, have a human and a divine mother who understands absolutely everything you're going through because she's been through it herself on the earth as a human being. And God knows she lived the hardest, most difficult, most demanding of lives and lived her whole life with such sincerity and vulnerability and strength and patience and openness. She knows the whole story. And there is nothing that you can do or say that could ever shock her. There's no anguish you're going through that she hasn't already gone through and knows exactly how crazy it makes you, how depressed it makes you, how paralyzed it makes you. And there is nothing, nothing you can do, even the most terrifying acts of evil that could ever separate you from her unconditional love, if only you acknowledge them and turn to her and ask for forgiveness. It really is as simple as that. And finding that out just 
transforms everything. This keeps me talking about it, it gets me very, not just excited, but so filled with gratitude for what I have been given and shown in the depths of my own life, the love and the forgiveness and the help. So that's what I know, and so many millions of ordinary, extraordinary people know about her. They know this. And I have met people of every class, all over the world, every religion, who know this about her. And who whisper, sometimes in secret, their secrets, thinking, oh my God, thank God I found somebody else who knows this, otherwise, I thought I might be going crazy, but they're not going crazy, they're going sane. It's really as insanely sane as this. There is an infinite love that is the mother, whose name is Mary, who is your mother, who loves you absolutely, who will forgive you anything if you turn to her in contrition, and who will help you out of any horrible dark pit you've dug yourself in from greed or craziness or stupidity or ignorance or any of the other multiple follies that we're all so good at proliferating it's amazing but don't believe a ragged old englishman try it try turning to her simply you'll find out so the next question with which I will end this, not now, but I will expand on this, <laughs> is, look, if this is all true, and I'm beginning to suspect that if millions of people feel this and know this, you can't be making it up. If this is true, and if there is the secret sun within me, and if I can discover that, and if I can discover how acting from that, even in the most ordinary ways, even in the ways I cook for friends, even in invoking her presence when I go to see someone I love so that our meeting can be filled with her love, even if I discover this, how do I practically Let's get real around here. How do I practically ground this love in myself and in the depths of my ordinary, extraordinary life? How do I do that? Because it's all very well talking in these glorious terms. It's inspiring, but times are desperate. I want to know right now how I can do this because I'm beginning to understand that it might be the most transformatory experience I could ever have on this earth to really believe and really know that I have in Mary a divine mother that has the full power of the motherhood of good behind her and is loving me uniquely as myself in the core of my life and willing to help me. That would be something. That really would be something. Well, there is a way to know. And the way that I'm going to offer you is just to look at her life and look at the five qualities that her life shows us are the ones that we need steadily, humbly to develop in ourselves, to remain in connection with her love force so that over time her grace can reveal to us just how powerful and magnificent we can be when we rest in her rely on her pray and turn to her for help and guidance so let's start at the beginning of this extraordinary woman's life in her childhood, and this is some a legend that you can find in the Sufi mystics and in the Gnostic Gospels, so it's a legend that has very ancient origins. In her childhood, 
her mother, Anna, recognized that she was a very specially evolved being and took her to the temple and gave her to the high priest to look after in the temple in Jerusalem. And this is what Rumi says about that. Rumi and his table talk. Rumi, an Islamic mystic who is completely inflamed with love for Mary, like so many of the great Islamic mystics. So, listen, it's wonderful. When Mary's mother bore her, she made a vow to dedicate her daughter to the house of God and not to interfere in her upbringing in any way. So she left her in a corner of the temple, and there she was found by the high priest Zachariah, who demanded to look after her, as did all the other priests. At that time, it was customary to settle disputes in the following way. Everyone concerned threw a stick on water. The one whose stick floated won. Zachariah won, and Mary was handed over to his care. And every day, Zachariah would bring food to the child, and every day he would always find the exact replica of what he was bringing her in the same corner of the temple. On Monday, he asked her, where did you get the other food? And Mary said, whenever I feel hungry, I ask God, and whatever I ask God, God sends. God's generosity and compassion are infinite, and whoever relies wholly on God finds God's help never fails. And Rumi adds, all things are in God's hands. To God, no miracle is impossible. God can do anything. God will do anything for anyone who believes and trusts in God. So the first, the first quality that her life shows us that we need to really develop, and it's a very difficult quality, given the craziness of many of our upbringings, the confusion of our karmas, the madness of a world that's so corrupt in so many ways where everybody seems to be lying. <laughs> The quality that we need to develop is trust. Trust in the essential goodness of the universe and in the essential love and mercy of the invisible powers that all the great religious figures of all the religions have told us about and how could they all be lying in exactly the same way. Either they're crazy or we are. And I've made my choice and I suspect that many of you have made your choice. The second quality that we need to evolve to really allow us to experience this miraculous love force and its subtle, amazing effects in the core of our ordinary lives is the quality that she manifests as a 12 year old girl, 12 years old, 12 or 13, when the angel Gabriel appears to her and announces that she has been chosen, this 12 year old girl, to be the mother of the being who has been destined to transform human history in Jewish terms, the Messiah. And she says, let it be done to me according to God's will. Let it be done to me according to God's will. And what she shows and has shown all her lovers by that statement is that the key to entering into the mysterious truth that mystics know is surrender. Surrender of why, surrender of 
all the pompous forms of reason surrender to wonder and mystery surrender to the invisible forces and this surrender that she does at that amazing moment as a 12 year old girl is not passivity is not her being overwhelmed and forced and compelled it's not weakness it's a sign of the greatest imaginable inner strength a strength so great that it can give her the astounding courage to accept whatever now has to happen for her to not only birth this amazing being but also endure whatever follows and i believe that at that moment when the angel revealed to her her destiny she saw and knew everything that would then unfold and she accepted everything because she was strong enough and her love for god and for humanity was great enough so the second quality that she's tenderly inviting us to evolve and she'll help us evolve if we let her is surrender a surrender of the vanity of thinking we know everything a surrender of our addiction to reason which limits us so much in the journey into mystery a surrender of all of our pathological fears and needs to control everything because secretly we are so terrified by impermanence and by the obvious difficulties of life and by the obvious and growing lunacy of the world but if we can learn in stages and steps and sometimes baby step forward and three steps backward to learn how to trust we can learn how to surrender and eventually and this has been my experience and it's the experience of all who have had the enormous luck and privilege and grace to know her and to be inspired and sustained by her it's been my experience there does come a time when you say in the terms of your own nature your own life your own mission your own work i accept whatever has to happen now because i know that love is doing the work and whatever i have to go through i know that if i turn to love as mary i'll be given whatever i need even at one minute to midnight which has often happened in my life and i'm sure in yours i'll be given whatever i need to carry what i am meant to give to its end and i live by that that's something i don't just tell you because it sounds lovely it's something that i have experienced innumerable times through her grace and it's something that if I hadn't experienced, I wouldn't be alive or pouring myself out at 70. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't even want to be on the earth if I didn't know the truth of what I've just said. And the third extraordinary gift <laughs> that Mary will give you, that the mother will give you through Mary, if you just turn to her as the face of the universal mother she'll give you the revelation clear and simple and luminous and amazing of the world that the mother is birthing through this horrific destruction that we're living through she'll give you the vision that she herself proclaimed in the magnificat many of you may have read casually the magnificat or heard it sung but 
you might not have noticed something that it took me many years to really get that the Magnificat is simply the most radical, the most revolutionary statement of total transformation of all conditions of world life that you will find in the Bible. As a Jesuit priest once said to me, Mary is to the left even of Jesus. True, just listen. When Mary proclaims the Magnificat, she says this, and this is the only thing she says in the Bible, but it's the core of the core of everything that Jesus said, because everything that he said had its roots in his infinitely loving, kind, peaceful, but profoundly radical and revolutionary mother. And this is a thrilling discovery when you make it, because you realize when you make it that the patriarchy, the boys club, have made of Mary a lovely, patient, all-suffering blonde who's going to help us whatever, without realizing or wanting to make conscious this radical passion for a total transformation of everything in the name of and through the force of love that is actually the essence of the divine motherhood of God and the essence of Mary's mission in humanity at this moment and in all ages. And this is what she says in the Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. I'm going to be geeky for a second and just say that when she speaks like that, she's echoing the voices of many liberated Jewish women in the Old Testament, Esther and Hannah's great song. And she's speaking from that tradition of women who know the Shekinah, who know the female side of God and speak from its strength, its courage, its majesty, its passion for justice. And if you really listen to what she's saying, which the boys club doesn't want you to do, in fact, one of the things that I discovered in my research into Mary was that when the Argentinian women in the 80s started to go onto the streets in the name of Mary and protest against the cruelty of the junta, they sang the Magnificat and the junta got the Catholic Church to ban the singing of the Magnificat in church because they didn't want anyone to get inflamed by the passion that was giving these women who had lost their sons and daughters to torture such guts. They didn't want that courage to flow to them, to empower them, to say, this has got to end. But those who really listen to Mary and realize that she's asking for, in the name of love, a triple, an interconnected revolution, a spiritual revolution in the name of the pure, naked, visceral love that we've been describing, 
an economic revolution in the name of the equality and dignity that is the real truth of what Jesus called the kingdom queendom and what she knew to be the true law of life and of the mother and a political revolution that dissolves all hierarchy to create a world in which all beings have a say in their fate and in their destiny and no one is ruled by despots and billionaires and psychopaths who are drunk on power she knew that the love force that she was one with and that she was birthing into the world was a love force that is destined if only we can align with it to change and transform all the forms of earth life and birth a wholly new human race and a wholly new humbler much more loving much more compassionate much more generous much more just much more harmonious way of being and doing everything and this revelation which comes to all those who love mary is one that will give you and me in this time this atrocious time where every structure we have ever thought permanent is dissolving, will give us the courage and the vision to understand something really essential, which is that this love force that we can get into connection with through revering Mary and through turning to her as our human divine mother, is a love force that is birthing out of chaos, a holy new order that is pouring new wine into new bottles in ways that if we can continue to continue in stability and faith and wonder and compassion, whatever happens will amaze us. So the third great quality that we need to, I believe, evolve in our ordinary lives is a belief in this message that comes straight from the heart of the mother to us, that the dream of God is for the establishment on earth of a wholly new human race and a wholly new world. And those who love the mother are those who turn up willing to dream with her that great dream and not just dream it that's relatively easy but to start with her help trying to live that truth right now in the way they speak in the way they love in the way they act in the way they treat waiters in the way they treat the person who's writing taking them in the Uber, live it now, live the birth now so it can radiate out in the middle of all of this madness that we're living. That's her message. The fourth quality that Mary shows that we need to evolve, to really integrate trust, integrate surrender, integrate this clear revelation of the world that she's birthing, is revealed in this wonderful phrase that has been the inspiration for innumerable Christian mystics, especially the great Christian women that I'm going to be sharing with you. The phrase, she pondered these things deep in her heart. She pondered these things deep in her heart. Because if you are really going to live the life of mother love and be a co-birther in your own small but vast way of this new humanity and this new world in the middle of all of this madness, if you're going to do that, you're going to need to have a deep, simple prayer practice, a deep, simple 
mystical practice, such as the saying of the rosary, the best practice of all, the one that will get you into direct connection with her. And you need to ponder what she's revealing to you and will reveal to you deep in your heart. You need to make moments or periods of silence in the middle of your crazy busy days, and we're all crazy busy, moments of silence in which you just sit with her and ponder what she's revealing to you so that it can seep over time into your depths of your mind, into the depths of your heart, and into the very cells of your body to begin to awaken them to the amazing possibility of being transformed by love into another kind of body, love's body. And when you begin to do that and trust her example and really ponder these things deep in your heart, she'll reveal to you the fifth quality that you need. And this is the hardest quality I find to really practice simply and ordinarily in the core of your life. And that quality is the quality that distinguishes the whole of her life. Patience. In the Quran, it says, God is with the patient. And one of the reasons that the prophet only left one image of the divine standing in the sanctuary in Mecca when he destroyed all other images of the divine, because as you know, in Islam, you cannot represent God. The only image he left was the image of Mary. Because through Mary, it seems he learned how to be patient and how to stand in the depths of your knowledge of love, in the radiance of your secret sun, and go through whatever you have to go through and see defeat after defeat after defeat and destruction after destruction after destruction of your hopes and still stay faithful in the depths of yourself to the vision that you've been given, knowing that if you do, there will come a time which you may not be alive to see in which that vision you've been faithful to will arrive. It's this kind of patience that gave the suffragettes the guts to risk being shot at and trampled by horses and derided and demonized and die without seeing votes for women, knowing that their work would in the end transform history. It's this patience that gave Oscar Wilde and the other pioneers of the divine feminine the guts to stand up for homosexuals, knowing that in their time, they'd be humiliated and derided, but knowing that if they did, slowly the dignity of their example would change the human heart. There would come a time when equality of marriage was accepted by all intelligent people. It's this patience that gave the early animal rights people their courage to go against two millennia of just thinking that animals exist to keep meat fresh and speaking relentlessly about the holiness of animals, knowing that in their lifetimes they may never see what we are now seeing, a great explosion of animal rights. Chile, two weeks ago, proclaimed animals citizens. The constitution has not been ratified, but this is an extraordinary leap forward in the middle of all the madness that we're going through. It's the mother breaking through but it took 
hundreds of thousands of ordinary people to believe in the sacredness of animals and having experienced it and to call for those rights, for those rights to be ratified for the first time. So if you're going to live her life in her, for her, and live for this vision of the birth, knowing that she is working this great birth in her own mysterious way through this terrible death, you're going to have to beg her, and God knows I beg her, for patience. You're going to have to beg her for patience. And you're going to have to come to understand through her the secret of patience. And the secret of patience, as I understand it, probably very flawedly, because I'm the most impatient person I know, well, second most important person, impatient person I know, is that patience is not resignation. Patience is not defeatism. Patience is not cynicism. I wrote it down this afternoon, and what I said to myself was that patience is a positive force of focused, unbreakable love. And when, through grace, you experience patience like that, it becomes easier to live in its glow. And it becomes easier to really understand beyond reason that why the Quran says, God is with the patient. And to commit yourself, whatever now happens, to believing in the vision of the Magnificat of the Mother and to continue living your life, glowing with trust and surrender and living the life of the birth now and offering it for the birth of a new humanity whenever and whatever happens. And the last great quality that she showed all her life in the most subtle, but also in the most obvious and astounding ways, because she was not only peaceful, she was also radical and revolutionary in all the ways that I've tried to describe. The last great quality is courage. Unbelievable courage. The courage at 12 to say yes to whatever she had to go through to birth the Messiah, the birth, the great embodied divine love consciousness that expressed itself through Jesus for all beings. The courage to flee with pregnant, well, pregnant and give birth in a manger. The courage to then flee Herod's attacks to try and eliminate the possibility of the Messiah being born. The courage to support and sustain the strange and magical and weird and probably despised and derided child she had to grow and help. The courage to be absolutely accepting of his need to reject her as he does in the gospel so that he can proclaim that all women are his mothers and he has one true mother in the divine. The courage to let him become himself the courage to stand by the cross, watching her beloved child, the child of her deepest love, being crucified. And Mary was not collapsing at the cross. She wasn't in hysterics at the cross as she's sometimes being represented. No, Elizabeth of the Trinity had a vision of Mary and she was standing at the cross, feeding her son, her strength, her hope, her indomitable patience, her incredible faith in the divine plan, in the divine vision for humanity, her courage to say to all the disciples, as some of the Gnostic Gospels tell us she did, that he's not dead, he's going to be resurrected. And he was. The courage to be with the disciples in disarray when they were being persecuted and derided by the Roman authorities after the resurrection. The courage to be the mother of the mystical church and the actual church. The courage to go on going on through everything the early church endured 
in the name of the love that she knew. Being one with it was the one real force of the one real world. That's the courage we're all going to need now. And that's the courage that we will be given by our mother. And you may say, well, <laughs> I can hear the need for all of these qualities, but I like them. And I understand. You might say my trust is shaky, my surrender reluctant, my remembrance and pondering deep in my heart very sporadic and scattered, my patience threadbare at best, and my courage intermittent and constantly threatened by growing fear. And God knows, in a time like this, it's very human and totally understandable to say those things. I say them. But I know three things, and I'd love to end with this. I know that when I say that to myself, I'm not failing, I'm just admitting that I am a, an ordinary, fallible, sometimes idiotic human being. I'm joining the whole human race. We're all feeling that, however we pretend. It's behind every pious mask you find a human being who is saying words like that in the core of his or her heart at this moment. It's the first thing I know. The second thing, <laughs> and this will cheer you up, the second thing I know is that she's so happy when I actually admit all of those things as I do, sitting chatting with her as I do. I think one of the great gifts that Carolyn has given us is her wonderful book on prayer when she invites us just to talk to God. And if you can't talk to Mary, naturally, simply, and chat with her, you've not yet discovered how intimate she is with you. And I more and more just talk to her and ask her, Will you please help me. I need your help right now and your guidance. And I need it for this and this and this. And it's obvious, isn't it? You know me, so please help me. And she, and she does, because she's so grateful when you admit your own fallibility and fear and mistakes and stupidity and folly, because being your mother, she knows all that about you. And the only thing she's scared of is that you might not and not turn enough to her for her help. That's all she wants to do is to help you, to sustain you, to support you, to guide you, to give you the guts and the patience and the courage to go forward. And she can only do that when you know that you don't yet have them, but that she will give them to you, which she will and she does. And the third thing I am beginning to know with more and more amazement and awe and wonder and in radical humility is something that I think, no, I believe, I know, is the greatest secret of all about her love. And it's expressed by St. Paul, and it's been experienced by mystics in all religions, but it's expressed amazingly by St. Paul when he says, 
where sin abounds, grace abounds super abundantly. Where sin abounds, grace abounds super abundantly. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. When I first read that, I thought, oh my god this is really the end of the patriarchy that single statement that's the mother's love look don't worry about the word sin if you don't like the word sin just say destructive behavior or craziness or whatever it is admit that you do it and let's get on with it and watch this amazing phrase is saying to you and i at this moment in this time where it's a where sin abounds sin is abounding and abounding and abounding on every level and in every realm it's saying don't be afraid don't be paralyzed don't despair because the love of god and especially the love of the motherhood of god and especially the love of the mother in and as mary is a mad love, is a love that goes beyond anything you can ever imagine and anything your reason will ever tell you is true. And it's a love so great and so infinite that it will love you most in your maddest mistakes if you admit them with a broken and a contrite heart. If you just say, I am lost, I'm broken, I'm stupid, I'm crazy. I've made all of these mistakes and I need your mercy and your help. And if you can say that sincerely and from the depths of your shattered open heart, then you'll discover something that will rock your world and make your heads and your heart swerve like Sybil. You'll discover that you'll never love more than when you're broken by what you discover in yourself. You'll discover that you'll never love more than when you feel at the end of the end of the night utterly, utterly despoiled of hope. You'll discover that you're never more adored by your mother than at the moments you wake up to the deepest shadows and the wounds in yourself that have made you sometimes so destructive and so crazy and so greedy and so stupid and so vain. You'll discover that. And when you discover what pours into you from her, at that moment, the love that she with crazy gorgeous precision pours into every part of your being saying to you i know exactly who you are i'm your mother i've always known these things about you and have they ever stopped me loving and protecting and helping you of course not i am the divine mother and i will never abandon you and i have never loved you more than when you stand naked before me and say like a little child help me i need you i need you so badly right now that's the moment when the skies open and rains of gold fall down and grace super abundant crazy gorgeous grace irrigates all the gardens of your inner and outer world but don't believe me try turning to her and finding out for yourself i wish you so much luck and grace on your journey into mary our universal mother Thank you.